In this video, I'm going to talk about how we can perform alcohol dehydration reaction in the chemistry lab. First, I'm going to explain a little bit about the hydration reaction for alcohols. In alcohols, we have a hydroxy group. This group is very poor living group. So if we want to perform any reaction regarding to removing of this hydroxy group, we need to convert this hydroxy group to better living groups. So the hydration reaction uh, need to perform under acidic conditions. This hydroxy group can protonate by a strong acid like sulfuric acid and convert to this intermediate. Right now, this group is water. And because water is a stable molecule, it is a very good living group. I'm going to explain performing this reaction for 2-methyl cyclohexanol. When we perform this reaction under acidic conditions, it produces OH2 positive. Then water can leave the structure and form a carbocation. Keep in mind this carbon is tertiary and this carbon is secondary. So here we have secondary carbocations. And because the neighbor of this carbon is tertiary, we can have a rearrangement of carbocations. If you don't remember the rearrangement of carbocation, there is a link for another video in the description of this video. You can watch it to review carbocation's formation and rearrangement. So we can have a rearrangement to the tertiary carbocations by hydride shift here. So right now there is two different types of carbocation. Each of these carbocation can produce different alkene for us in the next step. So I'm going to list both of these carbocations here. So this is the secondary carbocations and this is tertiary carbocations. We may remove this hydrogen or this hydrogen by a base so when it says base here it can be even water in the system the water can come and absorb the hydrogen from the molecule then this bond come here and make a double bond for us because we have two different possibilities from right and left of the carbocations we will have two different products we can have this product that this is one methyl cyclohexene and then we can have if we remove this hydrogen I'm going to change the color by green then our double bond will be here and this one is 3 methyl cyclohexene so we have two different products from this carbocation for the tertiary carbocations there is three different possibility for removing hydrogen but these two yellow hydrogen, they are equivalent, they are identical. So it produces only one type of product for us. And we are able also to remove hydrogen from methyl. So base can attack to the one of these hydrogen and produce the double bond outside of the cyclohexane ring. As you can see here, both of these carbocations can make one methyl cyclohexane for us. In general, when we have E1 mechanism, most of the time our major product comes from the more stable carbocations. That in this case it is tertiary. So tertiary carbocations is more stable than secondary carbocations. Also, there is another rules. We call it Zaitsev. Zaitsev rules. It says more substitute alkenes is our major product during the formation of alkene. This alkene here has three groups on the double bond. But this double bond, we have only two groups. So it, that one has three substitute and this one has two substitute. So this is our major product here. Same for the, these two. From both of these carbocations, our major product is one methyl cyclohexene. So our major product is one methyl cyclohexene. So after formation of the product, we are going to test by different methods. But first, how we can perform this reaction? 
For performing this reaction, we need to have a distillation setup in a round bottom flask that size is 25 milliliter. You are going to add 6 gram of our alcohols that in case is 2 methyl cyclohexanol 1.8 milliliter phosphoric acid and 1 milliliter concentrated sulfuric acid phosphoric acid is 85 percent after adding these compounds we need to start the heating the system it is very important to keep the thermometer tip exactly below the side arm of condenser to measure the accurate boiling point and of course this is the water in for the condenser and this is water out at the beginning you don't see any change in the temperature because there isn't any steam when we don't have any vapor the temperature doesn't go up but when the system starts to boiling the steam it comes and increases the temperature of thermometer the boiling point for the cyclohexanol is 163 celsius the boiling point for phosphoric acid is 213 for sulfuric acid is 337 celsius for our product boiling point is 110 celsius and also we know during this reaction water form and boiling point for water is 100 celsius so when the system start to boiling at the beginning the first compound is coming should be water so we're not supposed to collect water removing of water from the system by this way it help us to shift the reaction to the right regarding the Le Chatelier principle because we're removing water from our equilibrium so when thermometer shows us 101 celsius it means water is finished so then we need to start the collect everything coming after 101 celsius for collecting the product we need to put one centrifuge tube inside of the ice because the product is hot and also it's volatile so we want to cool it down to have higher percentage yields for our reaction and we collect it inside of the centrifuge tube when there isn't any more liquids come from the round bottom flask to the tube then we need to turn off the system and let it cool down then the remaining liquid inside of the round bottom flask can be dumped to the waste after collecting the product inside of the tube first we need to add one milliliter water inside of the tube then close the cap and shake it gently once two layers are separate from each other again we need to remove aqueous phase by the pipette Keep in mind the density for the product is 0.81 and density for water is 1. So the lower layer is aqueous or water and the top layer is our product inside of the tube. So when we want to remove water we need to put pipette inside of the lower layer and just remove the lower layer. So why we add water and shake it with the organic phase because we want to remove the remaining of acid that came with the product. In the next step, we are going to add 2 milliliter sodium bicarbonate solution to neutralize the remaining of acid in our organic phase. We know the reaction of acid and bicarbonate. It produces water and carbon dioxide gas. So when we close the cap and shake it slowly, the pressure builds up inside of the tube so we need to slowly open the cap and reduce the pressure we need to keep continue and shake it slowly and reduce the pressure until no more pressure builds up inside of the tube that means we don't have any more acid and our acid completely neutralized by sodium bicarbonate and then again we need to remove the aqueous solution once two layers form and then add two milliliter brine or sodium chloride solution to the organic phase and close the cap again and shake it slowly to remove the trace of water is remaining in the organic phase then we can dry our organic phase by 0.5 gram sodium sulfate so we are going to add 0.5 gram sodium sulfate inside of the tube 
Keep in mind, in each step we need to remove the aqueous phase when we want to move to the next step. Then after adding 0.5 gram of sodium sulfate and give it time for 5 minutes and then we are going to slowly remove our product and transfer it to a clean and pureated flask. And then we can calculate the mass of product. After purification of the product, first we are going to study our product by bromine test. We know bromine molecule Br2 has orange color. When it reacts with a double bond, it produces diboromoalkane and the product is colorless. So the colorization of bromine during this test, it means we have positive test and we should have double bond in our structure. For performing of this test, we need to add 0.5 milliliter ethyl acetate inside of a test tube, then add two drop of organic compounds, or I can just say two drop liquid, and also two drop one molar solution of Br2 in DCM. We are going to perform this test for product for our reactant that is 2-methyl cyclohexanol for cyclohexane and cyclohexene. So the last one is our reference for this test. Keep in mind bromine is a toxic compound and also DCM is very volatile solvent. So when you want to handle this reaction, always make sure it is inside of the fume hood. Also after finishing this test, when you dump the solution inside of the vase, you need to wash your test tube with ethyl acetate or DCM to wash the bromines and then dump it again to the vase. After that, we need to add 5 ml sodium hydrogen sulfide. This solution normally is 30%. Because bromine is a very dangerous and toxic compound, we are going to quench it by this solution. If you see the bromine color inside of the vase, that means your bromine is not quenched completely. And we should add more solution until the solution completely be colorless. In the second test, we are going to use Bayer test to see if we have any double bond in our structure. We are going to use 0.5 milliliter ethyl acetate to the wrap of organic compound. It can be our product or other reference. And also, we are going to add 1% alkaline potassium permanganate solution drop wise. We are going to perform this test again for our product for 2-methyl, for 2-methyl, cyclohexanol, for cyclohexane, and cyclohexene. And of course, again, our major reference is the last one. The color for potassium permanganate is purple and changing of this color, it is a positive result for this test. After these two tests, we need to study our product by IR. We know we had alcohols at the beginning and our product is alkene. So we should see the changing of the peaks for reactant and products. We need to have IR for both of reactant, that is our alcohol, and also our product. Thank you for watching this video. To watching more video, please subscribe our YouTube channel.